This is Dan Reinstein, and I will be lecturing on LASIK for high hyperopia. My financial disclosures include that, of course, I'm a consultant for Carl Zeiss Meditech, and I have a financial interest in the VHF digital ultrasound technology that's used to measure uh, several aspects of performing high hyperopic LASIK, and therefore it's involved in this talk. So let's start again with a crazy question, as I like to do. This is a patient who presents with plus 7, minus 250, and plus 875, minus 3, without amblyopia. And we're going to see about treatment options. Of course, we've got all of these corneal options available, or, of course, a partial correction using a corneal option, and phagic eye wells or a clear lens exchange. And, of course, most... Most ophthalmologists, and I mean most, uh, probably 99% of ophthalmologists, would go straight to clear lens exchange uh, for a patient as such as this. Depending on age, the level of informed consent severity will, will vary. PRK, of course, for very high hyperopia has been shown, as we will see, to not really be a good option for this. So it's kind of excluded as an option off the bat. SMILE is not quite yet available for this, although the initial results of our studies that are being performed by Kishore Pradhan in Nepal, together with a, a protocol that we're running out of London here, out of the London Vision Clinic, um, are very promising. So, But this is not quite available yet. Again, I'm going to show this slide, which summarizes the published statistical risks of intraocular complications that are associated with cataract surgery and therefore clear lens exchange. And of course, remembering that although these are unusual, uh, they can be catastrophic. Some of them less unusual than others. Macular edema, cystoid macular edema can occur, as I mentioned previously, can occur in a absolutely technically perfectly performed, flawlessly performed phaco emulsification with IOL insertion. And this, of course, leads to many lines of loss of best spectacle corrected vision, and that can be, of course, permanent. Of course, the risks of phagic eye well insertion in the anterior chamber. This, the artisan lens is a very good option, technically a little bit more challenging, but needs constant supervision because of endothelial cell loss, a potential of years. And the ICL or retro pupillary lenses, the PRL, which is not quite on the market anymore, uh, options which don't affect the endothelium apart from at the time of surgery, but can lead to long-term uh, issues with pigment dispersion, uveitis, and pupillary block, and you know so, re, things related to sizing issues that can re, result in cataract. So let's just say that this patient was not really keen on intraocular surgery. Is there a possibility of offering this patient LASIK? And I hope that at the end of this lecture, you'll understand that the answer to that is yes, but you need to have a lot of technological uh, expertise elements in place in order to be able to con contemplate treating this level of prescription, and there is a method of doing it, which is not the same as just plugging the refraction in and doing the case as one would for any other case. It's very important, I think, to know about the history of hyperopic LASIK because this puts into perspective why there's there are such mixed uh, reviews about performing hyperopic treatments on the cornea. And unfortunately, we have living history in that many of the laser systems that have historical ablation profiles and centration protocols are still widely available and therefore confusing the, the field tremendously. Hope that by the end of this lecture, this is all going to be a fairly clear picture, although it is a detailed, um, very detailed lecture. It's going to hopefully give you the whole uh, overall picture. So let's go to the first generation uh, hyperopic lasers. The very first laser to have been able to do hyperopic treatments was the MEL-60. And this was a broad area ablation with a mask that was rotating. And the optical zones, of course, were small. And you can see this. Uh, there was Because there was a suction ring that was placed onto the eye, and therefore the mask was attached to the suction ring, uh, if you centered everything perfectly, the result was uh, very good. But if you didn't have the suction ring on axis, uh, the result could be a perfectly uh, executed decentration. 
So the safety of uh, the very first generation was very poor. Uh, six, seven percent of people losing two lines and decentration risk was quite high. The other thing, of course, is that all of these procedures were uh, in the ni early 90s performed as PRK procedures. And it was noted that, you know, mid peripheral haze is far more common than central haze. And with the smaller optical zones went, of course, a lot more regression. Uh, the NIDIC EC5000 was um, another laser that came out with hyperopic ablation profiles, uh, but there was a tremendous amount of regression in these cases. I was um, doing my fellowship in Vancouver when Hugo Sutton had performed one of the first hyperopic treatments on a plus 350 uh, woman in her 30s. She had so much regression, 88% regression in her effect, that, and because nothing was known about what the, why the regression was occurring, um, an enhancement was performed, and this led actually to corneal perforation into the anterior chamber, which required an emergency corneal transplant. And she ended up with a cataract, which ended up with a FACO, uh, with a intraocular lens by Simon Holland. And she ended up with uncorrected vision in 2030, but um, long way around. This was published in Ophthalmology. So if we look at this NIDEC first-generation hyperopic profile, um, here are her scans as we performed them after the first procedure and before we really knew what we were looking at. This was one of the very first scans that I did when I arrived in Vancouver from my fellowship with a prototype machine. And literally, I scanned her on the day that she was having her enhancement when she came in. So there was we, we didn't even know what we were looking at here, and I couldn't do the scan across the whole cornea yet. Uh, so I had to scan one side of the cornea and then the other to get these two images to show the original ablation across the whole zone. But you can see here on these scans that the flap from the LASIK procedure is here. Bowman's, the surface of Bowman's, uh, is in red here on both sides. And you can see that the epithelial surface uh, produced a huge amount of regression of the intended uh, carve-out, let's say, in the mid-periphery. So you can see here about half of the effect or more than half of the thinning in the mid-periphery was compensated for by epithelial filling of that groove. And this was due to the fact that the NIDIC had very, very inadequate transitions. And you can see that from the ablation profile exits very, very quickly uh, from the deepest point. Many other lasers were also starting to be programmed with these small optical zone, small transition zone treatments. The Bausch & Loam at the time was called the 116 Caracor and 5 millimeter zone, loss of two lines, 16%. A uh, published study with a NIDIC, almost 10% loss of two lines at, uh, with a 5.5 millimeter to trans, uh, with a transition out to 9, uh, up to plus 6. And the Visix S2, centered on the pupil, again, all of these treatments were centered on the pupil, 10% loss of lines, it quoted as a 9 millimeter ablation zone, but it's the ablation zone they were cut, c c quoting, not the optical zone. The optical zone was about 5 or 5.5 millimeters. So we went into the second generation of lasers, uh, which were using flying spots. And the Bausch & Lomb 217C or 217C, 217C, had a 2 millimeter flying spot. Uh, it was a top hat configuration in energy. And because the spot was so large, it meant that the transition zone had to be 3 millimeters because to back out of the deepest point in the optical zone, back out, it took a long trajectory. This was a blessing in disguise because it meant that you had to have a large transition zone. Now, because of the 3 millimeter transition zone, they were only really able to do treatments in very small optical zones, 4.5, 5.5, because the flap sizes that could be achieved were 9, 9, 9.5 millimeters. So anyway, they, they were attempting these corrections in very small optical zones. And of course, there was 15% uh, loss of two lines. The other studies published, again, showing that the higher the level of hyperopia treated, the more regression that we achieved. Um, this is a great study by Eskenazi where he showed that uh, low, myo low hyperopia was relatively stable, moderate, less, and high, uh, very unstable, the lot of regression. The Spanish study uh, from the Barivera group, Rosario Sorriano, published very high hyperopia, plus 4 to plus 7. Uh, remember these numbers because this is the study that I'm going to show you later on. Uh, using modern technology. Uh, they used uh, zones up to six millimeters. They achieved a slightly 
better safety, but again, they don't, they demonstrated very clearly that the safety decreased considerably after you went above plus four, and certainly once you got above plus six, the safety was quite poor. Let's talk about intended ablation zone and achieved ablation zone. This patient was a plus four and had a primary LASIK with the Bausch and Lump 217Z, and the optical zone programmed was six millimeters. But you can see here by epithelial thickness profile on the left, you can see that the epithelium is thickest in a ring that is five millimeters wide. And therefore, even though we were programming six millimeters into this laser, we were only achieving a cut down in the deepest point of this hyperopic profile at the five millimeter zone. And this was similar, of course, with the Visix S2. And you can see here topographies. It was obvious that what was necessary to prove the outcomes and reduce regression was to increase the optical zone and redesign the transition zone so that it was more gradual. And so the second generation ablation profiles came out, the MEL70 had a 1.8 millimeter Gaussian flying spot. And the optical zone used in this study uh, by Klaus Ditson was six millimeters. Six millimeter transition zone out to nine. And you can see that actually up to plus six, the results were fairly good for spherical hyperopia and hyperopic astigmatism. You can see that after plus six, there was a nonlinear drop off in the efficacy of, of treatment. The safety, however, was excellent. It was an order of magnitude better to what we'd seen before for hyperopic ablation zones. And the stability was also uh, much, much better. So as you can see, as soon as we changed to Gaussian beams, which made a much smoother transition and, and a much more controlled transition zone with a larger optical zone, we got better stability. This is a study by the Italian group Speda uh, that published uh, all the way up to plus eight and he demonstrated with a 6 millimeter trans zone out to 9.6 that there was very good safety, a slightly less so in PRK than LASIK, as we know. And the PRK cases, as you can see here, uh, had more of an overshoot into myopia before they recovered to the target at the end. And obviously this is to do with, you know, the longer time it takes for the epithelium to regenerate into its final resting place after a surface ablation, which of course is far more of an injury to the cornea by PRK than there is to by LASIK. Here's a study by Zoltan Naji. This was a PRK study where he treated up to plus 750. The attempted versus achieved shows, you know, drop off again above plus six. Not very good safety. There was certainly a lot of loss of lines, uh, two lines and, and, and more um, with this study. And of course, it really led to most of us realizing at that point that PRK for higher hyperopia is just not a good idea. The third generation ablation pro profiles finally uh, were introduced into the MEL-80 and copied over by former employees into Wavelight and Schwind. The, this, the entire industry was spawned from Meditech. Wavelight was founded by a previous Meditech employee, and the programmers at Schwind have always come from Meditech, except recently. Sam Mosquera, who was trained by Hartmut Fogelsang, who came originally from Meditech. So Meditech spawned, uh, that's why the results from these lasers are somewhat similar, because really the, the, the secret sauce was passed on through, um, you know, lateral insemination in the industry. But you can see David O'Brien's study, uh, which is the first study to come out showing seven millimeter optical zones in high hyperopia, and he demonstrated superb uh, stability out to two years. Uh, below here is a pre-op and a post-op with a difference map uh, from plus 550. I've treated with ML80. You can see how large the optical zones are now compared to what you were seeing earlier. And, of course, this is part of the reason why we have better optics and less regression. Now, I want to talk about this very seriously. This is the absolutely incredible wave of ignorance that is out there with people being led to treat hyperopia by wavefront guided treatments. And not that I feel strongly about it, uh, but the point is that certain companies have deliberately forced surgeons and miseducated them into doing hyperopic wavefront guided treatments. And I want you to really be clear about why this is a bad idea. 
This is an example of a hyperopic eye, which you all know, hyperopes are more likely to have large angle kappas. Uh, the offset of this pupil is 0.8 millimeters uh, with respect to the visual axis. Now think about this. The patient was born with a vertex that is placed, as we see here in the rings image. This patient does not see aberrations when they look at the moon. They see one moon with no ghosting or coma around the moon. How is it then that we are going to do a treatment which a wavefront sensor is going to detect from the center of the pupil, thinking that this eye has coma because the vertex is displaced nasally in this left eye to the left, and is going to try and put that vertex into the center of the cornea to make the whole eye coma zero. It just doesn't make any sense that you're going to take a nascent geometry which does not have aberrations with respect to coma or, you know, centration issues, and you're going to move that vertex into the center of the cornea. It seems to me blindly obvious that this would be a bad idea, and yet optical scientists sitting around a table not, not thinking in terms of the way that we as refractive surgeons see patients end up putting out products that are have become FDA approved because they meet whatever these low criteria were for FDA approval. And then everyone does treatments this way, and then they get bad outcomes and poor visual quality, and then it gives hyperopic corneal treatments a bad reputation. This is a conglomerate study of a lot of eyes, 4,489 eyes treated with the Visix S4. And, you know, as you can see here, well, this laser was not good at treating hyperopia above plus one because, as you can see, the chances of losing lines of best spectacle corrected vision above plus one is unacceptable. Uh, certainly, when you go from above plus three, now the, li the, the rate of loss of lines is almost criminal because you're into the 20% range. Remember, this study was published in 2009. This means that the treatments were probably collected during the 2000s. And this was the period of time when the modern third generation of blazing profiles were available. So informed consent for a patient undergoing a Visix S4 treatment did not probably include saying, with this laser, you have a 20% chance or more of getting loss of two lines compared to if you'd gone to another surgeon who was using a Wavelight, a Schwind, or a, a Meditech laser. So this, this is the study that's constantly quoted by people trying to justify that hyperopic treatments are not safe on the cornea. And you, you ought to know this reference um, because it is very often quoted and it's, of course, needs to be qualified properly. And at the end of this lecture, you'll be very clear about uh, the pitfalls of this publication. So what led to improvements and in technique for treating hyperopic uh, refractions on the cornea. Well, we've talked about ablation profiles, uh, but we've also need to understand some of the elements and the pitfalls. Here is an attempted spherical equivalent refraction treated and a change in the Ks achieved. And you, we know that it's not very predictable how the Ks are going to change based on how much steepening you're intending. We know that if you steepen the cornea too much, the epithelium will uh, fall off the, the, the curve. It's just, it cannot take it. We know this from keratoconus. As a, as a cornea becomes too steep, the epithelium breaks down and the recurrent erosion, a recurrent uh, breakdown leads to scarring. Apical syndrome. Here's apical syndrome. Uh, here is a, you know, subepithelial scar on the anterior cornea due to repeated breakdown in a small optical zone, uh, treatment in a high hyperope with a Visix laser. Uh, we started looking at hyperopic ablations and what they did to the epithelial thickness profile during the 2000s and finally got around to collecting the data and publishing a landmark paper, if you like, on the behavior of the epithelium in hyperopic treatment. Now, um, I'll just go over for a couple of seconds here what the technology that we're using to measure epithelium is. This is um, a broadband 10 to 60 megahertz broadband ultrasound scanner that has a very high pachymetric precision within the cornea, can identify the different layers within the cornea, uh, 
uh, with one micron precision in measurement. And we can take scans in 3D at uh, different meridians to obtain a three-dimensional set that can make us three-dimensional pachymetric topography maps. We published in the year 2000 in the JRS our seminal paper on what we call a, a 12 map display, a C12 display of LASIK. And this uh, shows in the first column preoperative corneal thickness, stromal thickness, and epithelial thickness separately, the postoperative cornea, stroma, and epithelium separately after myopic ablation. And then we have the difference in epithelial thickness between pre and post, the difference in the stroma between pre and post, the residual stromal thickness in, in three dimensions the flap thickness profile after surgery, and then we can calculate the original full flap thickness by taking the stromal component of the flap postoperatively and adding it to the epithelial thickness pre-op. And that gives us the original in flap that was cut. The repeatability of epithelial thickness measurements in the center of the cornea is submicronic. It's 0.6 microns, very, very high repeatability. And we went and studied the epithelial changes in hyperopic LASIK. We had 65 eyes that were at least three months postoperatively. All of these eyes have been treated in the seven millimeter optical zone with a modern third generation ablation profile. All these patients have been treated using the microkeratome, uh, the hansitome. And this was for hyperopia between uh, plus 0.75 and plus 7 total data entry into the cornea, uh, including enhancements with stigmatism up to five diopters of sill. So this is the averaged epithelium of all of the 65 eyes. And so we, we stack them up all together. We mirror the right and left eyes, and we stack them up and get the average value for each location. And you can see that there is thickening of the epithelium, as we've seen before, in a donut fashion or around the groove that's created by the ablation profile. We can see that there is thinning of the epithelium over the increased curvature of the center of the cornea. And we can see that if we measure the, the diameter of the dugout, we can see that we achieved seven millimeters. So we programmed seven millimeters, we got seven millimeters. Now, it's very interesting to look at the correlations. If we look at the correlation between the attempted spherical refraction, which of course is the ablation depth programmed, and the change in epithelial thickness, we see that obviously the thinnest point in the epithelium becomes thinner the more you correct, and the thickest point in the epithelium becomes thicker the more you correct, of course. But let's look at this now clinically in terms of the K's change, because the K's are traditionally what are used to determine if you're doing uh, hyperopic changes in the cornea safely. And of course, as expected, you'd see that the thinnest epithelium occurs, the epithelium thins more and more and more the more you steepen the cornea and the the more you cut deep into treating a higher level of hyperopia, the more steepening that you effectuate, the thicker the epithelium will get. These are all, all obvious, but now let's look at some detail here. So here we see a cornea that has ended up postoperatively uh, with a K of 49.3 diopters. This is steep right around the limit that we like to talk about. And in fact, the epithelial thickness in the thinnest point in the central cornea is 26 microns. 26 microns is pretty much the limit. We, we know that at 21 microns, the epithelium keeps on breaking down constantly. At 26, many corneas are okay, but not all. 28, it's pretty safe in general. Uh, so at 26, we're at the limit and so obviously this cornea cannot undergo a further enhancement. That's obvious because now we've detected the fact that the epithelium is at its thinnest and we cannot further steepen this cornea. But here's an example of a cornea that's also got a keratometry of 50 postoperatively. But the thinnest point of the epithelium in the center is 44 microns. Now if this cornea needed an enhancement, it could actually be performed because we have a lot of room to go from a thinnest point of a 44 down to, let's say, 26 microns. So if there was a plus two enhancement to be done, even though technically you wouldn't have wanted to do it if you hadn't had an epithelial thickness measurement, you would, wouldn't think of steepening a cornea beyond 50. 
you actually physically can do that because you have confirmation that the epithelium will not break down. This is an example where the keratometry post-op was 41.5 doctors, and anybody would have considered performing a plus 1 or plus 125 enhancement to this patient. But it would not be possible because you've measured the epithelium and shown that the epithelium is already at the limit at 26 microns, and there's no room for further steepening. And here's an example of a cornea that's ended up at 52.6 diopters of keratometry and still has a healthy 36 micron minimum of epithelium. So again, this slide is critical in realizing that the standard that has been set traditionally of following what can further be done on a cornea and what can be predicted to be done on a primary treatment, this standard is being set by keratometry. And keratometry, as you can see, is not a reliable proxy for the true safety element, which is how thin is the epithelium over the central steepened area. Epithelial thickness profiles, therefore, the gold standard for determining safety in hyperopic corneal treatments. So in summary, because we get central epithelial thinning and peripheral epithelial thickening, these epithelial changes are being proportional to the amount treated. They form a much better metric for determining what can be done on a cornea. Remember that a flat cornea post-op can still have epithelium that's too thin for further enhancements. Likewise, a steeper cornea can have thick epithelium and can still be steepened further if necessary on the cornea. I'm only talking about modern ablation profiles here. I'm only talking about large optical zones uh, with uh, modern transition zones, which result in uh, you know, reasonable tear flow over the central cornea and reasonable patterns of eyelid stress onto the epithelium is something we'll come on to later on in the lecture series. So, as I've said, epithelial thickness monitoring is really a very important metric when you're considering enhancement in high hyperopia, but also even for low hyperopia, maintaining the level of safety that patients would be hoping for. Now let's talk a little bit about another technique element with respect to treating high hyperopia, and that is the two-stage protocol. We touched upon this in the process of high myopia, but for slightly different reasons, some of them similar, some of them different. Obviously, in high hyperopia, the result is less predictable than in myopia. There's often more regression, but there can be a lot of uh, a much larger overshoot than expected, at, you know, depending on whether the epithelium is very capable or very incapable of filling the trough that we create. So a two-stage approach can actually increase the accuracy of the final result because you can take advantage of an overcorrection. It minimizes the risk of producing an apical syndrome due to excessive steepening for that particular individual eye. And, of course, as for the myopic two-stage protocol, it gives us the option of finding out after the first stage if the patient has any to topographic or wavefront-based optical degradation, which we can then address with a topography-guided treatment. The two-stage treatment protocol that we instigated uh, in the study that I'm going to present involved the primary treatment being up to plus 650 in the maximum hyperopic meridian and a case not going above uh, 50 diopters in the first in the first predicted treatment. Postoperatively, the Artemis measurement would be made, the epithelium would be measured, the thinnest point located and calculated with respect to how much more room there is for further steepening based on this epithelial thickness minimum. The peripheral residual stromal thickness was also determined under the flap, and this also allows us to increase safety with respect to cutting too deep within the cornea, and the option of topography-guided zone enlargement or recentration was there for the patient if needed. Let's look at this thinnest residual stromal thickness. Remember that the RST thinnest point is not actually central after hyperopic ablation. And remember that an angle kappa in these patients means that part of the that the temporal uh, dugout will actually be occurring in a thinner part of the cornea than the nasal part of the dugout. 
because the cornea is tilted temporally in a positive angle kappa. So it's important to identify the thinnest point because let's say that this profile was going to be the ablation profile for the enhancement. That's quite different than if the ablation profile had to be the profile here on the right where the thinnest point is now where the maximum ablation depth is. And these have to match and we have to respect our RST limits. Topography guided treatments, as I said, highly effective with the MEL80 and MEL90 Tosca system. The Wavelight has a very good topography guided system as well, as does the Schwind. And here's an example of a patient who uh, was plus 750 minus 175 after treatment with a physics laser in a small optical zone. And as you can see, we uh, had a target of plus 150, uh, which means that we were treating plus six or so, maximum hyperopic meridian. But you see, we ended up with an overcorrection. The treatment, so the patient was ended up minus 125, minus a quarter, and now the optical zone was huge. So we blew the optical zone up from five millimeters up to eight millimeters. You can see the epithelial thickness change map and really a, a spectacular outcome because we actually got reading out of this eye, which we didn't expect. And we also increased the optical quality tremendously just with the topography guided treatment. Here's an example of a case where we, uh, one of our own treatments where the optical zone was smaller and uh, not quite as centered as we'd like. And at the time of enhancement, we used a topography guided treatment to enlarge the optical zone and recentrate uh, the optical zone. You can see the beautiful uh, recentration produced by the by the Tosca treatment of the MEL-80. Uh, here's the picture of the apical syndrome that I showed earlier. Here's the high-frequency ultrasound image showing the subepithelial scar. And by using the epithelial thickness map, we can plan a transepithelial PTK. And as you can see, we can very nicely eradicate the scar reduce the central steepening, the, the rate of change of curvature of the stromal surface, and result in a perfectly clear cornea, a return to best spectacle corrected vision. Here's the uh, map of the epithelium with the scar. And as you can see, our Artemis guided transepithelial PTK simulation, this will be discussed at great length during the therapeutic session towards the end of the course. Um, but you can see that we can plan in advance what the ablation breakthrough pattern is going to be and how we're going to create stromal ablation removal that will reduce the um, steepness of the center of the cornea while we're removing the scar. And all this is done anatomically predicted in advance rather than doing it on the fly as you're doing the PTK in the OR at the time. The next element that we have to discuss with respect to improving high hyperopic treatments, well, any hyperopic treatment, but specifically high hyperopic treatments, is on centration. And I spent a little bit of time emphasizing the importance of being violently against doing hyperopic wavefront guided treatments because of angle kappa considerations. And this is a study which took us two years uh, to get through the review process uh, because the reviewers were biased towards the old way of thinking. And, you know, this is a lesson in, in the review process and shows how it works because we never took the bias of the reviewers as acceptable. And we kept on rebutting the uh, reviewers' comments. And we can tell that one of them was a, uh, was a real optical scientist, but one who thought in the old school of the pencil of light going through the pupil, and that's what's important only, and not, and not thinking about the fact that the cornea has a nascent anatomy and that the brain has nascent wavefront filtration systems that are based on the asymmetric geometry of the eye, uh, and that readjusting those parameters is, you know, obviously not acceptable to the brain. So in this study, what, what we did was to justify the protocol, but we couldn't, we couldn't randomize patients to center of the pupil or off-axis angle kappa because that would, by definition, produce decentrations in 50% of the patients based on our belief system of how this works. So we did something clever, but let's, let's just first go over a little bit of logic, how you would explain this to a first-year optometry student in terms of why visual axis centration of refractive surgical procedures is preferable to the centration on the entrance pupil. And let me just again emphasize this. Certain laser systems, the physics, with a wavefront guided treatment, 
does not give the option of centering the treatment on the vertex and treating the wavefront as such. So even though they have most of the market share on the planet, most of the surgeons are now forced to treat on the entrance people. Let's look at a slide as to why this isn't quite logical. In an eye with no angle kappa, that means that the vertex of the cornea, of the coaxially fixating eye, is in the center of the entrance pupil. And when we refract this patient, the foropter lens is, well, coaxial with this axis. In the case of an angle kappa, the eye is turned and the vertex of the cornea is not the center of the pupil. However, when we refract the patient, the foropter lens is not presented centered on the entrance pupil. It's presented to the patient coaxially with their visual axis. So the refraction is taken from a rotated eye. So what logic is there in then taking a refraction from a rotated eye and then applying that refraction centered on the entrance pupil? That doesn't make any sense at all. It's logical to apply that refraction where it was measured. And you, of course, there's no such thing, you know, the old saying that um, the greatest composer is he who can remember a melody that no one else can remember. Well, Melin Pandy, in his early training days, did the gold standard landmark paper in centration. Uh, they looked at optical zone centration in corneal refractive surgery, it was PRK at the time, vis-a-vis -vis the entrance pupil center, the visual axis, the coaxially sided corneal reflex, or the geometric corneal center. These were all very, very pertinent questions in the early 90s when PRK was starting, particularly as they were using f four millimeter optical zones. And any decentration of four millimeter optical zone causes huge visual problems. And their con conclusion was that centration on the coaxially sided corneal reflex is the optimal position. It's not going to be perfect because there are variations in the relationship between the visual axis and the coaxially fixated uh, corneal reflex, but this was the preferred, statistically most likely to give a good outcome position. So the way we tested this was to design a very clever retrospective study that didn't harm anybody. So what we did here was to retrospectively interrogate our database and pick out consecutive patients treated by hyperopic LASIK where the sphere treated was at least plus 250. We we're going to exclude low hyperopic treatments because we're talking about centration here, then we needed the decentration to have a significant effect on the visual result. And we extracted all of these patients and we looked for patients who had no angle kappa or let's say an angle kappa that was within 0 0.25 millimeters of offset from the entrance pupil center. And we then devised a second test group. All of our patients, remember, were treated on the coaxially sided corneal light reflex. All of our patients are treated like that. But when we took out and separated the ones that had no angle kappa and compared them to a, the second group where we made the offset be more than 0.55 millimeters with a gap between the two groups, so there was no overlap, we now have two distinct populations, all of them treated on the coaxially sided corneal light reflex, but the ones that didn't have an angle kappa were treated in their entrance pupil, by definition, whereas those that had a large angle kappa were treated outside of the entrance pupil by more than 0.5 millimeters, which is the definition of a decentration that will cause optical effects. So we were setting ourselves up here to publish results if we were in the entrance pupil belief group we would have then expected the outcome of the large angle kappa group to be terrible because all of these patients were treated with more than 0.5 millimeters of decentration on the converse proof by exclusion 
if the outcomes of these two groups were the same, then by definition, treatment on the coaxially sided corneal reflex is better, by definition. Because had we treated the offset group in the center of the pupil, they would have had a decentration of more than 0.5 millimeters. And surprise, surprise, the results showed that the safety, the accuracy, the astigmatic correction, the contrast sensitivity, practically the same, and the subjective night vision disturbances were the same for both groups. It's very interesting to look at the aberrations because this kind of shows you where the misunderstanding is coming from. The optical scientists that consider the eye as from a wavefront sensor using whole eye measurements are restricted to the entrance pupil because the lens lit array or the, the dots that are being used to map the wavefront are restricted to what can go through the pupil. And because of the mathematical constraints, they have to analyze it orthogonally from the center of the pupil because you can't have a Zernike expansion series on an offset system that is not symmetrical. That's actually how this has happened. For a small angle kappa group, aberrations were essentially the same whether measured by corneal aberrations or whole eye aberrations. That's because we didn't change the inside of the eye. We performed equivalent matched treatments in both these groups. And so the coma was not different whether it was measured on the cornea alone or with the whole eye taken into account because everything was centered on the entrance pupil. However, if we look at the large angle kappa group, the corneal aberrations post-op were 0.28 microns measured on the cornea, but 0.6 microns measured by whole eye. Of course they are. We've treated off-center from the center of the pupil, and we're measuring from the center of the pupil. So clearly, a wavefront sensor is going to detect an increase in coma. And that was statistically significant. It affected the, the overall high-order RMS as well, as you can see from the bottom line here. Now, interestingly, the post-op spherical aberration measured either by corneal aberrations alone or by the whole eye were the same between the two groups. So all of this makes sense. I hope it, uh, I hope it does. We've been through our wavefront lectures, and here you're seeing wavefront coming alive in a study. So the fact that the results were similar between the small and large angle kappa groups proves that entrance pupil centration hypothesis is incorrect, that the correct hypothesis is the coaxially sided corneal light reflex, which will follow the angle kappa. And yes, an eye that doesn't have an angle kappa will have an entrance pupil centration treatment. But it doesn't make it right just because you've diluted your cohort and you're comparing outcomes without discrete groups. There are several papers that have been published ostensibly proving the opposite of what our, our study showed, but their, their flaw is that they made a cutoff between angle kappa and no angle kappa, which meant that there was a huge overlap zone that marred the differences between the two groups. Uh, and in those studies, the treatment wasn't necessarily performed with an advanced laser. Let's look at a final element of surgical technique. And here is a patient who had been treated by an intralase flap and a 217C for hyperopia uh, two years previously. And I just put this up because I want to show you how the flap is not uh, adequately distended in the bed. You can see that there's a gap, which of course has been filled by epithelium. This gap can appear because the flap is now draping over a slightly larger trajectory to go from the center to the edge of the flap, right? We've taken tissue out, and now the flap has to travel further to get to the edge of the flap. In this slide, you can see that I've detected a small gap here on post-op day one, and I can see a very, very tiny microfold here uh, on the left, and on the right here you can see uh, negative staining. And you can see that I've now pushed this flap nasally with a dry sponge. Here, this is post-op day one at the slit lamp, and I've closed that gap. So I've removed that fold, and I've now distended the flap right out to the edge so that there's no gap. 
So what I'm going to do now, we've discussed everything we need to know theoretically about treating high hyperopia. I'm going to now present the results of what happens when you have all of this extra knowledge and all of this extra technology to be able to do this. So we're reporting here the outcomes of LASIK for hyperopia using the mel AD extra laser for very high hyperopia. This is hyperopia above plus four with patients selected for the study if they had 20-20 or better vision preoperatively and with a minimum of one year follow-up. And we report the two-year data if it was available. So in this study, the treatments were performed for the most part in the seven millimeter zone. The occasional treatment was done in the 6.5 millimeter zone due to geometric or other reasons. Most of the patients were treated with the Visumax femsecond laser flaps, but a good third of them were still done with the Hansetil. And as I've said, the flap was centered on the coaxially fixated reflex and the ablation was centered on the coaxially sided corneal reflex. We found retrospectively in our database 797 consecutive eyes that met these criteria of 651 patients, age range from 18 to 70 years of age. There was a female preponderance in the mix. The maximum hyperopic treatment delivered to each cornea, that means the primary plus the enhancement ablations all together, ranged from plus four up to plus 975. None, of course, we only treated up to plus 650 on the primary treatment, and the secondary treatment was performed using the epithelial maps to determine if further steepening could be performed, and so the total ablation into the cornea went up to plus 975. This tells us, um, using this protocol, how much steepening can actually be done and what the safety of doing that is. Cylinder, as you know, we, we represent all of our refractions always in negative sill format. Uh, so the cylinder was up to five diopters, and we had 41% follow-up at one year and actually 60% follow-up at two years. So the results I'm going to show include all the retreatments. And a fifth of these patients, one in five of these patients, were done as two-stage treatments for the reasons I delineated earlier. And retreatments for full correction cases, in other words, cases where we didn't intend to do this in two stages, the, the probability of needing an enhancement uh, was 35%. 4% of these retreatments were done as a topography-guided treatment, meaning 4% of the time we thought that the ablation profile should be recentered or enlarged for whatever clinical reasons. So here's the attempted versus achieved graph. You see some cases where the spherical equivalent was lower than plus four, but remember the study is, is about the maximum hyperopic meridian. That's the deepest ablation point. It had to be plus four. So a plus 350 plus a half would be a plus four treatment or a plus four minus two was still a plus four maximum hyperopic meridian treatment. So 798 eyes at two years post-op, and you can see that we're slightly undercorrecting uh, as we go up in the high hyperopia, but given that the scatter increases a lot as we go up, the amount of myopic overcorrection is not something that we want to emphasize. If someone ends up myopically overcorrected, that can be an advantage if your nomogram is set slightly to undercorrect, if you see uh, the logic there. The 67% of the eyes were within half diopter of intended, 89% were within uh, one diopter of intended. If we look at the efficacy, and this can only obviously be measured for the eyes that were intended to Plano, to a Plano target, 259 of these eyes, we had 76% at 20-20, with 100% obviously with the best spectacle corrective vision starting at 2020. The safety was very good. We had 0.5% of eyes losing two lines and no eyes losing more than two lines. That was four eyes out of 798 eyes at two years. Contrast sensitivity was not decreased in these cases. So uh, there was less than one patch decrease at 3 and 6 CPD, one patch decrease at 12 and 18 CPD, but this wasn't clinically significant, of course. It was statistically significant. The stability, which of course is the big question, we have 798 eyes out two years, and the number of eyes that changed more than a diopter within that three-month to 12-month period was 11%. But if we look at the Ks, we see that actually the Ks were technically stable. There was a 0.03 diopter shift in flattening, but actually you could call that statistically insignificant. 
but there was a 0.2 diopter shift in refraction. And of course, this is because um, of lens changes. Complications? Well, you know, the main issue with hyperopic ablations is dry eye post-op. So the dry eye was actively managed by the clinic on average for up to 12 to 18 months. No patient was effectively discharged until their dry eye management had been stabilized. Uh, on average, patients stopped using artificial tears by about the six-month period. It was a significant complication that we detected, and this was detected in one patient that we bent and um, uh, found other cases. We've published a paper on this uh, separately. This is already in the literature, and it's to do with diurnal fluctuation in the refraction, and it's related to diurnal epithelial thickness profile changes. Two patients in this nearly 800 I series experienced this diurnal refraction fluctuation symptom at two years. And of course, we've diagnosed this as being due to epithelial thickness profile changes. And of course, the treatment for this is to reverse some of the excess steepening, which is causing this diurnal fluctuation. We look at other studies from the Wavelight Allegretto up to plus 650. Again, zero loss of two lines. These were, this was actually a very small study with not very good follow up, uh, but. Um, we look at then at the Schwindaziris, uh, the predecessor of the Amaris, uh, published in 2006, 1.8% loss of two lines uh, for hyperopia up to plus seven, with 86% within a half diopter of intended. George Waring published the multicenter study for NIDIC, EC5000, using an, a six millimeter optical zone now with transition up to, I think, nine millimeters, 1.4% loss of two lines and 61% uh, within a half diopter intended. Another Schwindaziris study showing no loss of two lines up to plus 750. And another Schwindaziris paper by Diego uh, Duarte, who's also lecturing in this series uh, with no loss of lines, demonstrating the keratometry gradient from the center towards the periphery in, in this publication, 88% within a half diopter. The Jovet study in the Baviera group from Spain using the uh, MEL-80 from plus 360 up to plus 625, demonstrating only 4% loss of two lines with 63% accuracy. A couple of outliers here. Uh, John Canalopoulos using the Wavelight IQ, using a topography-guided hyperopic system, which, of course, automatically centers on the vertex of the cornea because that's the center of a topography map. And with two-year data showing excellent safety, 2.4% loss of two lines, and 76% of the eyes within a half diopter of intended with really good accuracy, even above plus six, as you can see here. The Canalopolis study with LASIK extra, that is flash cross-linking associated with the primary LASIK procedure, very small number of eyes, only 27 eyes in this study. The power of the study is not very high, but there is a suggestion here that doing cross-linking at the same time might enable less overshoot to happen initially and possibly may make the cornea more stable over time. Um, so this is very interesting and this is definitely work that ought to be continued and expanded upon uh, with larger numbers to see if this really uh, pans out because if it does then this is another feather to put into the armamentarium of high hyperopic treatments. Let's now summarize all of the LASIK studies published with modern eczema lasers for high hyperopia, all of the clear lens exchange studies with multifocals or not, the artisan phacic eye well studies, the PRL studies, and the ICL studies. So if we take all of these studies in the literature and we average each of them out, so you get the mean, mean published outcome, we can see that the MEL-80 outcomes that we published in our paper, plus four up to plus nine data entry, you can see that our results are, match all of the published results from other systems very, very well. They are very favorable with respect to the accuracy of clear lens exchange, which, as it turns out, is less accurate than LASIK, including enhancements, which is very interesting because if you consider that if the accuracy of plus or minus a half diopter is 52% for clear lens exchange, Think about the number of patients who are going to require a LASIK procedure as a second procedure to optimize their outcome. 
all the reasons for arguing against LASIK in, a, in an older age group, dry eye, all of that stuff, well, that's out the window now because now you're having to use an extra laser anyway. Uh, the Arzen studies showing, you know, good outcomes, the PRL, the ICL studies, yep, all good, all good. But these procedures go inside the eye. They require long-term monitoring for ocular health safety because, of course, loss of endothelium, cataract formation, pigment dispersion, intraocular inflammation, trauma to the eye, you know, with, a, with an intraocular lens floating around in the posterior chamber. All of these issues are permanent when a lens is put inside the eye, whereas obviously a LASIK patient can be discharged effectively once they're stable and the dry eye has been managed. All of the intraocular complications, the catastrophic, yes rare, yes unusual, but catastrophic complications of vision that are not repairable because there is no retinal transplant. So in conclusion, LASIK for hyperopia up to plus 8 in our study with the MEL-80 demonstrated good safety, efficacy, and stability for a two-year follow-up period. And when I'm saying good, I'm qualifying that with respect to the alternatives, which are clear lens exchange and fake guy wells. This depends on critical elements, the ablation profile design, using large optical zones, centering the flap and the ablation on the coaxially sided corneal light reflex, using a two-stage procedure approach if required, determining retreatment safety based on epithelial thickness profiles, and also being able to measure the residual stromal thickness topographically in order to make sure that the tissue removal safety parameters are being observed on enhancements, and of course having topography-guided custom ablation available in case the optical requirements are there for a patient post-op. Of course, there was a small refractive progression noted between one and two years, but as we showed, the average keratometry was stable, and therefore, obviously, these were lenticular changes. And I know that there are a number of people who say, well, since there's going to be a hyperopic progression from the lens, why punish the cornea for the sins of the lens? And the answer is, well, safety comes first, and so safety over efficacy. Uh, the efficacy for these two procedures is similar. Uh, so the accuracy for these two procedures is actually better on eczema lasers, as shown, and therefore LASIK is avoiding potentially catastrophic complications associated with intraocular surgery, and given the number of patients who would have required an eczema laser ablation to make the intraocular procedure as accurate as a LASIK procedure with an enhancement, it does seem to be a little bit of a circular argument to argue that clear lens exchange categorically in any patient over the age of X should be done because they're going to get a cataract, because they're going to have lens progression. Safety comes first. And in a way, what's happened in the community is that arguing that this is permanent lens exchange without including the safety argument and the safety, the complication argument as a part of that is, is essentially a lack of informed consent for patients. And as students in this course, I think it's very important that you come out with the highest qualification and understanding of the whole field. And therefore, you're able to give patients really informed uh, consent that is based on published fact. And, you know, this lecture is extremely controversial because it only involves a very small number of you saw all the publications. They're basically, most of these publications are by a very small number of groups that keep on recurring in the literature. So this is a small cohort of surgeons who are able to do this, and that's because the vast majority of surgeons are still using second-generation ablation profiles and therefore getting poor outcomes with hyperopia and therefore giving informed consent to their patients based on their own experience and not the actual available literature and what is the available knowledge. So here we go back to our original case. Best treatment option for this uh, ridiculously high hyperopic patient with astigmatism. Okay, so let's just, uh, you know, for obvious reasons I picked this case, but it's a demonstration. The primary procedure was performed as a planned undercorrection. This was a two-stage treatment. Actually, the patient was happy to have residual refractor because their spherical equivalent of plus six, plus 650 in the left eye, meant that the reading glasses were going to end up, you know, being plus 
eight, and you all know the prismatic and, and spherical aberration errors, and forget about very focals and and optics of those kinds of lenses, not to mention the weight of these lenses and the cost of these lenses. The patient was quite happy to have their hyperopia debulked in a bilateral procedure that heals in a few hours and will have dry for a certain number of months rather than undergoing a clear lens exchange, which we did offer the patient, of course, at the time, at the same time, saying and explaining that they're much more likely to get a full correction if we were to start with a clear lens exchange. At the end of the follow-up period, we found that the corneal curvature postoperatively, in fact, wasn't steep. It was just over 47 diopters. We looked at the epithelial thickness profiles and found that actually, uh, surprisingly, uh, this patient still had huge reserves in terms of the minimum epithelial thickness in each eye, 39 microns on the right, on the right, 36 microns on the left. So we performed an enhancement. And once the enhancement had stabilized at uh, one year, uh, you can see here that the outcome was superb. Patient was nearly plano in each eye and was delighted with the outcome. The patient was seeing 20, 25 at distance and reading J1, all of the spherical aberration in the cornea with a plano result meant that they had a phenomenal depth of field and she was able to therefore see very, very well uh, up close despite only being plano at her presbyopic age. So thank you very much.